Yeah. <laughs> I think I told you, it's like, you know, we do all these things and my dad finally like started helping my mom last week with like cleaning the groceries and taking care of that. And we're standing on the porch and he's got gloves on. <laughs> Starts like touching his face and we're like, no. Right, yeah. Like this is the one way we have eliminated all other possibilities. This is the one way you can still get sick. I do like, I started wearing, I told you this, the bandana to the store instead of the like face mask. And it's so much better. You're right, like when I talk, it doesn't fall off. I'm not fidgeting with it. Plus, I feel like a badass. <laughs> I'm like walking past the cop with like a backwards flat bill on and my yeah. bandana and I'm like, what's up? <laughs> yeah, Ryan loves wearing the Jazz Fest bandana. I'm the organic bandit. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> All right, we'll get into it. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah, so. Hey everyone, welcome to With That Being Said. This is a very special <laughs> Roof Fitness podcast. I don't know what's special about it other than we are still in our COVID edition, COVID cast edition. I'm Bradley. This is Sarah. I said it. Sorry, I ruined your introduction. How are you doing today, Sarah? Good. I mean, we worked so hard to get that down to a science and you just took it for yourself. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't I'm, yeah, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, I'll let it slide this time, but if it happens again next week, we'll have a problem. Oh, good. I like it. So, um, Sarah, you're looking very, like, cute and hipstery, but at the same time, <laughs> like, throwback to, like, 1994. Yeah, with my flannel. Yeah, I, I dig it, though. Yeah, the as soon as the AC kicks on in the house, I'm freezing. But then when it kicks off, I'm fine. You're hot. Oh, the panels yeah. perfect. Yeah, Emily likes to keep upstairs on like 73 or 74, um, and at that temperature, it is too hot in the rest of the house. But if I put it down to 70, she's complaining about the electricity bill. So, what are you we gonna do? Win some, you lose some. Win some, and you lose some. So today I wanted to talk about kind of like, and it doesn't have to be limited to maybe the last five years, uh, which ironically is also a Broadway musical um, that is <laughs> that's a really good soundtrack. Uh, they have a song on there called Summer in Ohio, um, which is really fantastic. And I also hear shades of that song um, in a lot of the Frozen 2 songs. So that's just an FYI. For anyone out there that's watching Frozen 2 and has also seen the last five years. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll get started. So this doesn't have to be limited to the last five years. Uh, but I kind of want to talk about things that maybe you thought were right, but then over time changed due to either your experience in the health and nutrition world or fitness. So I'll get it kicked off. So I I was always, everybody knows this, I was pudgy in high school, I was pudgy in college, but for whatever reason, I always thought that you could spot trim certain areas, right? Like I could work this, this certain thing and lose my love handles. So I was doing like ab exercises till I was blue in the face when the reality is I just have to eat better, go into a caloric deficit and do some overall functional movements, yes? Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, I know I researched like eight, nine years ago, like what foods are best for losing like belly fat and people still <laughs> ask that all the time. Or I will have a nutrition client in the consultation, say they try to eat certain foods to help get rid of that, but there's no magic foods that take care of that for you. No. It, or full, magic exercises. That, right. That so from your waist. Full disclosure. <laughs> so I know this, right? Like this has been a staple of my fitness mantra. I've been telling people, women this for like the last five years. <laughs> but um, two days ago, uh, for whatever reason, like a week and a half ago, I was feeling super slim and ripped. And then like, I just went off the rails on a Sunday and drank like two bottles of wine and had all these brownies and all this other crap. 
okay? Right. And then just kind of didn't recover for two to three days. And then that led for me to getting this like warped sense of a mental picture of myself. Um, and so I found myself two days ago Googling how can I lose my love handles without uh, plastic surgery? <laughs> and so I started reading some of these articles and I'm like, this is stupid. And, and believe it or not, there are still articles written in 2020 about how to lose your love handles. Yeah. And it's all terrible. It's all terrible. I, I saw some kind of, it was a, a graphic making fun of, it was specifically women's magazines and how it was like the front cover is someone in a bikini and it's five exercises to trim your waist and six foods for fat loss. And here's a cake recipe at the bottom. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. So like, you think about it, like there's a lot of people that still take this information as like legit knowledge, you know? Right. I mean, the fact that it's still new articles are still being published today. Um, and also, I mean, it just, when you are stressed enough, it, it's interesting. It's easy to fall back on those beliefs we had before. It was super easy. I found myself in that position and I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And like, I read it through and I'm like, just stop eating like an asshole, Bradley. Yeah. Um, and I remember, and I'm thinking about this now because we all have our three year anniversary tomorrow. I remember people asking me if I was doing like a special wedding diet and I was like no I'm just gonna try to not eat like an asshole for a few months and it is what it is <laughs> right yeah I exactly so uh what is like one thing you kind of remember so definitely that but something that was very prevalent in my house was um more that the most important thing was kind of the the quantity of food you were taking in right so <clears throat> I remember my mother for my middle sister's wedding restricted her calories a bunch and did the slim fast diet and she ended up looking great but then that led to a lot of super processed calorie controlled snacks in the house right and we all know that eating real whole foods is best but there was this like knowing that, but ultimately still feeling like the most important thing for reaching goals was to restrict the calories, no matter where they came from. So lots of those hundred calorie snack packs and low fat, this and that. Um, I think some of those can still be found at my parents' house, but um, yeah, that that at the end of the day trumped eating your fruits and veggies. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's funny you like say that because that kind of like brings me to my next thing, which was when I started uh, CrossFit, you know, a decade ago, I was super into paleo, right? And that's kind of like when the whole paleo fad was happening. Um, and so like I read the books, you know, but I, I feel like just because I read the books didn't give me a base of knowledge before I read the books. If right. that if that makes sense. So I misinterpreted the information. And I think a lot of people misinterpreted the information um, where, you know, Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf were telling me one thing and which was basically, you know, to eat whole natural occurring foods, that type of thing. And I took it as like, I can eat as much bacon and butter as possible. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. So I think that kind of trigger, I mean, for me, I bring up, you know, these limited calorie things and low fat this and low fat that, but it's just taken on new names. Right. Um, and, you know, you, you start to think if you don't really understand paleo and why you should be doing it that way and how to really do it, then you start buying like, oh, I'll have paleo pancakes with right. six pieces of bacon for breakfast. And then, um, you know, people buying all of this organic stuff. And at a good, ex my favorite example is that 
you can get organic gummy bears, but it's still a gummy bear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I and, and, and actually, like on that same thing, and th this is not in theory not as bad as that, or like on the surface doesn't make is not as clear, but it's still pretty crazy, is that I would drink, you know, a bulletproof coffee back in the day, which in itself isn't terrible, right? Except that I would drink a bulletproof coffee and then I would have three eggs and like three pieces of bacon, which is basically like my fat intake for three days. <laughs> right. And I would it have is. that for breakfast, okay? So like, I, I mean, the amount of calories I was consuming, it's insane you know? Um, but again, at that moment in time, I didn't have a good like base of understanding of what I was working with. So I completely misinterpreted the data. Right. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so like fast forward, um, to the keto craze and I got really into keto. Uh, but I also had a better base of understanding for what was going when I went through that. So when I really went into keto um, for those 30 days and got super shredded while well, I was measuring my food. So right. like I, I was in a caloric deficit, you know, I was, you know, hitting the proper amounts. If you do, if you do keto, you know, and you are not measuring out the exact amount of protein and fat grams and carbs, well, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's not something you just kind of go in and out of and you eat high fat for a couple days and... Right, no, it is not something you go in and out of. Like I thought you could go in and out of before like I really studied up on it. And it was, it's just interesting like how you think you could be doing something good or like it could be good for a couple of people, but in actuality, like it could cause you to gain weight or, or send you in a downward spiral or the opposite direction. Right. So I have to, I don't think I've ever told you this and I will leave their names out of it, but some dear friends of mine, um, the husband has experimented with keto mm -hmm. and like effectively, like he's done it the right way. But my dear friend has complained about the keto breath <laughs> and basically, oh, yeah. basically this last time he did it, she said, you have to commit so that you can get past it because I cannot go through it again. And one time we were talking about the podcast and she said, you and Bradley should do an entire podcast on keto breath because I can't deal with it anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I remember being ultra aware of that. And I, I don't know, because I, I had heard of it and I had read of it. Um, I'm sure I I'm had it. I'm sure people like experienced it. Uh, with me but like i remember thinking i needed to like brush my teeth all the time or like yeah. uh oh here's a good trick for that like let's say um because maybe your toothpaste has sugar in it right you know because okay. some some toothpaste do uh a trick for bad breath that i learned when i worked at the balcony reception hall passing out food as a server for weddings um is that you could take a lemon and suck on lemon and that will get rid of your bad breath it'll strip the enamel off your teeth but at the same time but don't do it often right don't do it often but it is a nice little trick if you get in a pinch you could just like suck on a little lemon uh or maybe like avoid your teeth and there you, you go if, if you're listening i'm sticking my tongue out and acting like i'm rubbing a lemon on my tongue this might drive up our youtube viewership just <laughs> 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 Any, any, any other things for you? Yeah, I mean, just a big thing that it took me a while to wrap my head around was just the idea that men and women didn't need to work out differently. Um, coming from a dance background and into kind of expanding that and um, exploring more aspects of fitness, I will say when I really started working out, all of it was body weight, lots of plyometrics, high reps, little to no weight because I didn't want to bulk up, which now I know is completely dependent on, I mean, mostly dependent on the food I'm eating. Um, and yeah, just this idea that different, the different genders should work out differently for their body types. Right. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I've had like a lot of maybe what you would say like fitness revelations over the time where I'm not sure if I was a hundred percent like, Oh, I know what this is. And then that changed more of like my view on it changed or I learned more and it helped refine it per se. So like, you know, I learned the deadlift and how to squat and all that stuff um, a long time ago, but it, maybe like two or three years ago after doing it for seven, eight, nine years that I really learned uh, like how to pull with my hamstrings, you know what I mean? Or sit back in it. And it just took a long time to figure out how to engage my back, those types of things where, um, mm -hmm. You have to do it for a long time and then all of a sudden something clicks or somebody gives you uh, a cue and then it changes how you pull off the ground. Yeah, I think, I mean, I could really go into 20 other little things I thought were true in the moment. Right. Um, in terms of diet, there's times where low carb is best and high fat is best and never mind, have lots of carbs or eat all this protein. Um, right drink these shakes. But I think the biggest thing I have learned, and a lot of it comes through the experience I have had in ex doing kind of experiments on myself is just to never, doing my best to never think one way is the right way, even for myself, because that changes all the time. Like I remember maybe five or six years ago, I couldn't, I ate much higher fat, and much lower carbs. And now that's completely flipped. And just, um, there's no right way for one person all the time. Yeah. And I mean, that even comes with training. And if you think about how like uh, CrossFit has evolved over the past 15, 20 years, um, where in the beginning, when I started, even well before you ever started, like it was like, hey, these are the 20 movements of CrossFit, basically. I think there was 40. You could break it down to 40. Um, but it was pretty much these 40 movements. That's, that's what you did. That's what you programmed around, that kind of stuff. Like, there was no bench press. No one was bench pressing. Like, it was all strict press, um, shoulder press, but, you know, everything from there. Uh, no one was even doing all this dumbbell work. Like, there wasn't a lot of dumbbell work. You know, there was kettlebells, barbells, medicine balls, and then, you know, rowing, the bike didn't exist yet, you know, those types of things. Right. And then like, I don't know if it was a change in the community or if the CrossFit games changed it or something like that. I think there was a change in the community first where it's like, hey, we can still do all this other stuff with just like the CrossFit style of training. Um, and I think that's what you see now where there is nothing that is off the table. You know, there's yeah. bodybuilding stuff that we do, um, all kinds of stuff. Like I, I even see some stuff that you might see in a pure bar studio and, and I'm doing that, you know, if it works, it works. And so like, I feel like where before I was married to an, uh, a set of ideas, how now I am open to everything. Yeah. And that's the beauty of this style of fitness that you and I in this community have embraced is that it's all inclusive. Right. And it really wasn't before. Whereas now it, it's living up to, I don't know if I, not necessarily the name, but it's, I feel like finally really living up to what it's been preaching the entire time. No, I, I think it, I think it's exactly what you said in terms of it's living up to the name. Like it's truly crosses all barriers now where maybe before it, it didn't like it was, it was very like, I mean, it's still kind of cultish, but not, not as, not as cultish in the terms of like, everyone's doing like whatever is the best thing we can do to get fit. Let's do it. Yeah. So and yeah, it's, it's it up as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the other thing I wanted to hit on is I think people take a long time to figure this out. And I just want to throw this one movement out there. Uh, when you do pull-ups, like a lot of people can do pull-ups, right? Right. How long did it take you to figure out how to actually pull with your back? 
I don't know. Like, I couldn't tell you because the first few times I got pull-ups, it was with a grip where I was using more biceps right. than anything else. I will say I do think um, working out at working and working out at more of your Globo gym for a while helped. Mm -hmm. And so I went from working out with, I was just, I was dancing and running. And then I met Gerald Green. Right. And we started all these body weight park workouts. And then I started working at a gym and I started doing a lot of your typical bodybuilding stuff. So I spent a lot of time on like bodybuilding.com and all these right. other sites. Think like, researching ways to get better specifically at something like pull-ups and in reading about isolating certain muscles i think i luckily had um kind of the wherewithal to make that mind muscle connection and i don't remember the moment it clicked but i know that it was a because of that yeah i think that it's, it's interesting like a lot of people think that uh bodybuilders don't make good crossfitters because they're stiff I actually think it's the opposite. Like, I think they, they make really, they do really well in functional fitness um, because they have that, they practice that mind muscle connection. You know, yeah. like, you know, if I look at like Brad Scott and he knows, you know, what the chest is supposed to feel like in a bench press, you know, how many people are thinking about that? Not a lot of people are thinking about that. Maybe that's something we need to talk about more, you know, um, is feeling. Um, and envisioning the muscle doing what it's supposed to do during that movement. Yeah, and that links back to not thinking one certain way is the right way, because if you do have bodybuilders that are open to it, or vice versa, CrossFitters that are open to doing more bodybuilding, you, you just reap the benefits. Um, but I mean, even I'll say I had a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth with right. CrossFit, you know, eight years ago because of what I was currently doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was, the thing that got me thinking about this is I was talking to Renee uh, and I was talking to him about chest to bar pull-ups. And um, I was like, look, you need to feel your lats engaging in order to get your chest up to physically touch that bar for strict chest of our pulls. He's like, man, I just, I can't feel it. I can't feel it. And I'm trying to teach him how to feel it. And it's, it's almost like your mind has to make that connection. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's just interesting how that works. And it's just something you not, you don't think about that often. So, Oh, like, uh, and it's the same thing that holds true with running. Um, like who thinks, you know, I, I know people think there's a proper way to running. Normally you think like, oh, well, it's my, uh, you know, maybe it's my foot strike, right? Whether it's heel, t you know, ball of your foot, mid foot strike, all those things. Um, but it really took me training with Gerald for about six months to, to not only think like, okay, if I feel it in my calves, I'm not running right. You know, do I feel it in my hamstrings and my butt? Okay, I have the right form. You know, those right. types of things. Are my quads lit up? Well, I'm doing something wrong. You know, all those types of things um, make it super interesting how you perform a certain movement. You know, like when you squat now, are, are you just feeling it in your quads or you feel it in your quads, hamstrings, and glutes? Because if you feel all three, you're doing it right. Yeah. So I just, yeah. I, I think people should start paying attention to that more if they're not, you know, or, or, you know, if you're sitting and you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I've never thought about that. Well, here, here's your go. Here's your chance. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. And I think in all of this, there's kind of, I don't know, knowing and understanding. So all of us know that these magical things we try aren't going to happen overnight, right. but I don't know that a lot of us really understand that. Um, and that takes time and practice and a lot of practice and patience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm still learning things about my body, um, you know, today, but, you know, after, after all these years, you know, I actually, uh, I have always squatted one particular way, um, toes slightly out, you know, um, feet right outside my hips, the way you're taught in every, you know, CrossFit seminar ever and how those before have taught 
to you as well. But I know like in my mind, I have picked up a couple of things that maybe Jonathan has said over time. Even Glenn has talked to me about uh, these different set of theories on squatting. Um, and so yesterday I was feeling a little bit of knee pain and I like changed my stance to directly underneath my hips and my toes straight forward and then tried to like bow out my knees without with my toes staying straight and it yeah. completely took all the pain off my knee it was so interesting um and it's so it's like you can always try things new and then even though something might be heaven has been ingrained in your mind for the past decade you're still learning things picking up in the back of your mind so that when you need to make a switch you know that information that has presented to you for so long is there to go and get Right. And just like we talked about your nutrition changes over your life and your needs change. So does it from a physical standpoint, right. um, like the way I squat now is different than the way I did when I started CrossFit four years ago. And I am four years older. Um, I have, I live under different circumstances. I have different day-to-day -day stressors. My body's been through a lot more in the last four years. So that is going to change the way it moves as well. And I need to not um, get too married to how things were four years ago. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I think that's a beautiful point is like, uh, you know, maybe a lot of people who just come to the gym and they aren't thinking about this stuff and they've been working out for four or five years don't realize that while they are fitter now, they are stronger now, their body has also taken a lot, much more of a toll than it did uh, before. So you may need to change the way you approach things, you know, in order to keep pushing forward and keep working out on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. So. Um, and it, it, nobody wants to necessarily hear it, but like your body just gets older. You need yeah. to adjust for that. Like I, you're not, I'm not old, but I also notice a difference in the way I was able to move and recover from when I was 18 to, you know, just shy of 30 like it's very different it changes all the time when you hit 30 i promise you it's going to feel way different for, for whatever reason that was like the magic year like i i don't know it sounds crazy because it's such a young age right but especially doing crossfit like from like 27 28 29 i hit 30 and i'm like oh i'm not recovering quite like i thought i would and this doesn't i don't know it's gonna be super hard to tell just because of the circumstances with me turning 30 right. like it's gonna be coming out of quarantine everything's gonna suck anyway <laughs> true very true very true so all right uh blame it on that you should you totally should anything else to add um no i mean i think that's those are the the biggest things that come to mind and we could get into hours of nitty-gritty talk um about little things we thought were true or held true and now have a different opinion on, but I think those are the big things. Yeah, absolutely. I, but I think the main takeaway from this is you should always be willing to like keep an open mind and then with new information presented to you, change your opinion on it. Don't, don't be married to any one philosophy. And um, patience. That goes politically too, politically too. And I'm just going to throw that out there. And patient. I like that too. So um, I don't think as a whole, we do a good enough job of really seeing things through. Like we'll say, I'm going to try this and see how it feels, but we don't really take the time to see how we are feeling when we start and how we feel when it ends and actually like sticking to it for a few weeks or a month. Yeah. I want to squeeze this in. Like I know, I know a person who like, switches nutrition coaches like every two to three months and and they've been through like four or five in the past maybe like year and a half and they're like I don't, I don't understand I don't understand why I'm losing weight I'm like you're not trying anything for a long enough time or right. sticking with anything there's a reason with us at Rue we suggest six months and it started as three and I think people can see meaningful change they're lucky it's six months because I told Emily it should be a year. <laughs> she, cause she asked, she asked, I, I, you know, we talk about that and we still talk about this to this day, you know? Yeah. Um, and I am like, and it's different for everyone, but for, I said for most people, you know, how long does it take to develop the habits, you know, uh, make those changes in your life and then stick with them to where 
those habits are lifelong that they no longer need you. And she's like, you know, anywhere from six months to a year. And I'm like, well, you should make it a year because if it takes six months and, or they quit at five or let's say they quit at six and, and at month number four, they just started to develop those habits. They didn't really give a chance for themselves to change. Right. right. So that's my thoughts. But from a monetary standpoint and a sales standpoint, it's hard to sell a year, you know, um, and it's hard to get people to commit to that long. So I totally get it, but that's all. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Six months feels doable. Yeah, yeah. A year is daunting. Well, especially when you're looking, we're totally going off on a tangent, but when, usually by the time someone hires a coach, they're like ready. There's usually been some sort of breaking point for them. Um, so to suddenly feel like, okay, I'm ready. I need this to happen now, but oh, it might not happen for a year is a really hard mental barrier right. to break. I see what you're saying. Absolutely. So that's why you guys are the nutrition coaches. What? So, all right, y'all. Uh, hope you enjoyed this one today. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast uh, on iTunes or Spotify or Google Play, wherever you catch your, your podcast at. Um, also, you can check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, Rue Fitness. Uh, make sure to give us a five-star rating and leave a nice little review. <laughs> All, anything less than five stars, please do not put. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, but seriously. All right. All right, y'all. Hope you had a good one. Uh, keep living that quarantine life. Bye. Bye.